CSEG journey with me, Ryan. In the next section, we're going to pick up the routing overview. And this leads us swiftly on to the third section of the CSENT or ICND1 blueprint. In the last video, we finished up with a bonus video regarding the packet tracer, GNS and physical hardware. And we also had a discussion around the last layer two topic, which was error discovery. In this video, we're going to set the scene for the next couple of videos and ask ourselves some of the questions that we should be able to answer as we progress towards the end of the routing section. On a side note, because I'm from England, I will be saying router and routing, not router or routing. So we've got all that excitement also to come. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn or Twitter. Let's start the discussion with a few points. First up, end station and host routing. Now this is something we did talk about when we discussed ARP, the address resolution protocol. So I'd highly recommend going back and ensuring that you understand ARP in detail before continuing with the routing. But we will cover a very basic overview in this video to ensure that we're all on the same page before we move in to routing. The, un the understanding being is if I'm trying to reach something on my network within my IP range, within my VLAN or broadcast domain, all those terminologies being one of the same to an extent, do I need to up for my gateway or do I up for the direct destination? And we know that if the destination is on my network, I need to up directly for it. If the destination is not on my network, then I need to up for the default gateway. We need to ensure that we understand why one happens over the other and the ARP process in general. Once we understand why we need to go to our default gateway in order to reach certain destinations, we then need to understand what happens when our default gateway passes it further upstream onto different routers. And this is the frame rewrite and packet handling on a per hop basis. So if I've got a couple of routers connected, maybe that connects to a switch and then off to another router. Do I understand that as a frame comes ingress on a router and it's switched to the egress interface out towards this router, received in, switched out, and then goes across the switch, what's happening at the frame? So the decapsulation, encapsulation process on a per hop basis, how that differs as it goes through a switch, and then what are the rules around packet handling? Why does the TTL have to decrement? Why do I have to create a new CRC on the trailer of the layer two frame? And why does the routing pass it to one interface over another and why that decision might be made? So for example, if I have two interfaces and I receive a packet on this particular interface, do I go this way or do I go this way? How does that routing process work? Why does it work that way? And what are the rules and limitations around achieving routing? So we need to understand things like the longest match. If in my routing table, I have 1.2.0.0 slash 16, 1.2.3.0 slash 24, and 1.2.3.4 slash 32, and I receive a packet with the destination of 1, 2, 3, 4. Do I know and understand why this 32 will be preferred over this 24 or this 16? And do I know that if the recursion were to fail on this slash 32, that the slash 24 will be the second preferred route? And if I have multiple routes to the same destination, do I understand how AD plays a part in that, the administrative distance? And if the administrative distance is the same, do I understand metric and that the metric differs on different IGPs, RIP versus OSPF. Now, things like OSPF is not in the ICND1 blueprint, 
at least not in this version. However, we need to still understand the difference between distance vector and link state. And understanding very high level RIP and OSPF will help understand the differences between these two protocols. And understanding two protocols along with static routing will help us achieve our understanding of the routing rules and the process that the routers go in, going through on a per hop basis. And in turn, help us understand the configuration on how we would actually configure a static route versus how we would configure RIP and why we may do one over the other. And once we understand the routing process, the routing rules, and what happens on a per hop basis, and why we had to go to our router in the first place, then we can start to do something a little bit fancy like traffic engineering. And traffic engineering sounds a bit more complex than what it is, but ultimately it's just manipulating a metric or another routing attribute like longest match to achieve one path over another. So for example, if I've got a network set up, maybe something like this, and I have a PC connected to this router, how can I ensure that traffic goes this way for a particular route and goes that way for a different route? Maybe this is something we want to achieve and do we understand how we could achieve that and why? This here I would expect to be at the cutting edge of the ICND, ICND1 knowledge as far as routing is concerned. But as I said many times before, it's very rare that people stop at the CSEN, they normally continue for the CCNA, and the more you spend learning at the CSEN, the easier the CCNA will become. So I will go over in uh, maybe a bit more depth than needed, but certainly not wasted, the routing and why that routing may occur on a per hop basis and how we can manipulate it through very, very basic traffic engineering. So briefly, before we get started, let's talk about the first topic, which I said is the end station or host routing. So first things first, each PC device has its own internal routing table. If you take, for example, this PC that I'm on, if you were to put root print at the command line, let me just get rid of that. There you go, root print and hit enter. You can see that this is my uh, table on the particular PC. And you can see that I have a default gateway of all zeros to go towards the 192.168.1281 out this particular interface. And this is a routing table. It's got metrics to determine one hop over the another. It's got a bunch of things like multicast ranges that I'm listening on and so forth. This is the same for our routers. But the reason we don't associate the routing table with our end host is because the decision of the end host is very simple. Is it on my network? Great. Let's go to it directly. Is it not on my network? Let's not go to it directly. The reason it's important to know that there is a routing table is because if I have, let's say, two NICs, then I can create some sort of static routing to prefer one NIC over the other. And the reason that's important, let's say I have an internet connection on one NIC and I have an internal network on the other NIC, I can ensure that maybe some public IPs are routed to the internal NIC as opposed of defaulting towards the internet NIC. So the decision that a PC has to make is very straightforward and I'm gonna outline it now very quickly. If this doesn't make sense to you, then go back and watch the relevant videos that are highlight that's needed for each step. So here down the bottom, we have this diagram and we have two PCs. We have PC A and PC B. Both of these PCs sit in the 192.168.0.0 slash 24 network. Now instantly that slash 24 should be ringing a, a few things in your mind. First, you're going to know that the first three octets are referred to as the network portion and the last octet 
is referred to as your host portion. Now, because you know in an octet there are eight bits, because an octet is eight, which is one byte, we know that we can use the formula two to the power of n minus two, which in this case would give us 254 usable IPs. If you're not sure how I came about getting the amount of usable IPs by looking at the network prefix or the CIDR notation, then go back and watch the subnetting videos. Because of that, we know what network our PC is sitting. We can go ahead and assign the IPs to the clients. So we're going to give it .200 for PCA, .100 for PCB, and .1 as the default gateway, which will be this particular router. As far as the ARP process is concerned, this will occur to find the MAC address of an individual host. And if the MAC address of an individual host is already learnt, then the ARP process will not need to occur. So it tends to only happen on the initial communication until the ARP cache expires on a PC, to which case the ARP will need to happen again. But ARP, first of all, to know who to ARP, we ask ourselves a simple question. Is the destination IP on our network? As in, is it in the 192.168.0.24 range? If it is, then I can ARP to it directly. I can send out an ARP asking for the MAC address of the 192.168.0.100. If the host is not on my network, let's say for example, it's 8.8.8.8, .8 then I can simply do a binary and calculation using the subnet mask. And from that, I can cipher that the 8.8.8 the .8 .8 IP address is not on my network. Therefore, I'll need to ARP for my default gateway and send it to the default gateway. When the default gateway receives the layer two frame, the destination MAC address will be for the router itself. So the router will decapsulate the frame, look inside at the destination IP, which would be 8.8.8.8. .8 Notice that this IP address is not for itself and then pass it upstream to its default gateway, which may be towards the internet. It's important that you understand the ARP process between how you would determine whether the host that you're trying to communicate with is on your network or not, and how that is put into play by looking at the subnet mask and the current IP that you are assigned, and then how that ARP process would work to either host in your network or towards the default gateway. What happens when the frame hits the routing and onwards is what we're going to pick up over the next couple of videos. Okay, so that's all we've got time for in this lesson. I want to cut the lesson a little bit short because I'm conscious that the next couple of topics are quite in depth and will require their own individual videos. So in this particular video, we went through the introduction of routing in the sense of we know what's about to come. We understand some of the questions that we need to be asking ourselves and hopefully we know the answers to them over the next couple of videos. Up to now, we've primarily talked about the networking fundamentals, understanding the OSI and switching. It's really important that you understand the OSI model because as the switching and routing uh, connect to one another on a per hop basis, it changes what happens at layer two, layer three, and layer four when it reaches the actual end destination. Understanding how the OSI model works helps you in more detail at a later date. We then discuss what's to come. We said that we're going to understand the packet uh, rewrites on a per hop basis. We're going to talk about some of the actual rules of routing. For example, you always prefer the longest match over AD over metric and why at the beginning this may seem a bit of a hindrance but as you go through your studies you'll start to realize that it's actually a logical method and enables some very fancy traffic engineering. I said that you really need to understand subnetting and ARP for the next couple of videos but notice I've put subnetting is basics. 
I wouldn't be too concerned if you don't understand the subnet in fully, as long as you understand the concept behind it, and maybe some of the more common slash notations like slash 24s, slash 16s, and so forth. You wouldn't, don't need to be a subnet and guru in order to understand routing, and in fact, routing will certainly help you with understanding subnets in general. But I would highly recommend that you understand ARP, why ARP is needed, and why we go to our default gateway versus someone directly on our network. And the reason ARP is important is because remember we talked about traffic between routers? Well, if traffic goes between routers and these links between routers are Ethernet links, then the routers will also need to perform ARP in order to resolve the next hop. So ARP is a protocol that you need to understand now before we get into the more complex routing. I hope this video has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing and if it has been please do like and subscribe.